hormones are really key for brain aging, especially in women. There are some very important turning points that accelerate aging and slow down aging. In my profession, as a, you know, in medicine, we very much have not been taught throughout right. our careers. And even now when you talk to colleagues, I'm not convinced that there is a widespread understanding that the female brain is different from the male brain. There are real biological differences that are really important for our health. So I've been looking at brain scans forever, as I mentioned, and I can guarantee that there is no such thing as a gendered brain. When people tell you, I can look at two brains and tell you this is male, this is female, absolutely impossible. Just, just no way to do that. The differences are subtle and they're functional rather than structural. It's not the anatomy that is different. It's really the functionality of the brain. And what's really important and what my research has shown consistently, which I'm very happy about, is that our brains age differently. That we think about aging as something that is quite linear, and that is pretty much the case in men. It's just great. It's a great thing. For women, it's more like a step ladder. There are some very important turning points that accelerate aging and slow down aging. Accelerate aging, slow it down. And as scientists and as clinicians, we're just never told that this is the case. We're not told that we age differently, and we're not told why that is the case. And one of the big answers that we have come up with is that our hormones are really key for brain aging, especially in women. You said before that for women, as they age, there's often a stepwise change. You know, with men, it's yeah. more gradual. What, you know, are there key moments in life where these step changes start to happen? And if so, what are they? They are the, the three Ps, puberty, pregnancy, perimenopause. So puberty is obviously common to both men and women, and is really the beginning of our life as adults, right? So the brain, from the moment of conception, the brain has been growing, 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 growing at light speed. But once we hit puberty, there's a moment, that, these are called neuroendocrine transition states. And what the word means is that is our neurological system, our brain, and their endocrine systems that are in transition together. So something is changing. You're maturing from a sexual perspective, but so is your brain in ways that go above and beyond reproduction. So during puberty, there's this explosion of hormonal power that in a very interesting way leads to the brain losing volume. You would think the brain would explode as well. Instead, it's exactly the opposite. The brain says, okay, that's it, enough growing, I need to specialize. And so a number of synapses, which are the connection between neurons are just being discarded because the brain doesn't need them anymore. At that point, you know how to lace up your shoes, right? You know how to ride a bike. You don't need to remember all the, the, the different little steps. Those neurons can go, those connections can go. And the brain gets smaller, but more efficient. And those, those neurons that you have in your brain once you're an adolescent are pretty much all the neurons you'll have for the rest of your life. Your synapses will change, will grow, will get discarded, but your neurons pretty much are final. And then for men, things remain pretty stable over time. And I want to just clarify that these changes are mediated by your hormones. And we all know that hormones differ between men and women, right? Men have more androgens, like testosterone. Women have more estrogens, like estradiol, which is the most potent of our estrogens. And what's important is that these hormones are not just key for reproduction and fertility. They're also really incredibly important for brain function. They literally supercharge your brain. So when the levels of these hormones are high, your brain energy is also high. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's really profound because mm -hmm. 
we, you know, in common parlance, we, we often talk about our puberty and how people start, you know, obviously what it means for boys and girls when they go through puberty. Um, we, we know about these different stages in life, but we often think about them through the lens of hormones. And even, you know, the general public will talk about it as hormonal changes. Yeah. But we often don't make the link. Never. That, that hormones <laughs> that are changing in our body also have an impact on our brain. And, and so I think what you're doing with your work is really you know, almost getting that conversation up on a par saying, yes, it's hormones, you, you know it's hormones, but those hormones actually change the way your brain functions as yeah. well. Yes, those are the same hormones and it's just not common knowledge, I find. Even with scientists, I, I studied neuroscience, I have a PhD in neuroscience and nuclear medicine, and no once did anyone mention hormones to me. Menopause. Yeah, you know, we know that that happens to women, but how and why nobody seems to care about, to really talk about. So it's interesting for me that I, I literally work at the intersection between neurology, neuroscience, and women's health. And it's a really strange space to work in. <laughs> there are many people who work in neuroscience, and there are so many people who work in women's health, but they don't talk to each other. A woman who's 60 years old is almost twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease in the rest of her life than she is to develop breast cancer. And nobody talks about Alzheimer's disease as something that women should be concerned about or should know about. Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of old age. We tend to associate it with the elderly because the symptoms develop usually when people are like in their 70s, the average age at onset here in the United States is 71 years old. But in truth, Alzheimer's disease starts with negative changes in the brain, years if not decades prior to the cognitive symptoms. It's a very insidious disease, it's a, it's a silent disease that starts in midlife and accumulates over time. And then eventually the damage is so severe that you get clinical symptoms. And so the question changed to, given that Alzheimer's disease is a disease of midlife or middle age, what happens in midlife only to women and not to men that could potentially explain why more women than men have Alzheimer's disease? And we just showed recently that what happens to women is that we tend to develop Alzheimer's plaques before men do at an earlier age than men do, and specifically during the transition to menopause. And that created chaos <laughs> when we showed that. That was like a like, whoa. Because we never ever talk about menopause as something that could be associated with Alzheimer's disease. We never talk about menopause as something that could potentially impact their brains right, let alone increased risk of Alzheimer's in women. So that was a big deal. And for me, I was not expecting that, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, Lisa, as you, as you sort of talk through that. It makes know, sense. I, it, it makes complete sense. Yeah. Because, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Professor Dale Bredesen um, in, in California. I don't, you, I'm sure you've seen some of Dale's work and some of his research. And you know, he's said on many occasions that, you know, Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia may be starting even 30 years before it shows up. Now, I'm not, you may or may not agree with that, but he is, he is sort of said that, that the idea being that when you get symptoms is not when this starts. This starts That's a right. long way before. And therefore, yeah. there's an opportunity if we're aware of that to start taking preemptive and preventive action, you know, in our 30s and our 40s and our 50s, right. not when we're suddenly getting the diagnosis at the age of 72, let's say. So right. I want to just hammer home that the, the, the things in your book that uh, are based absolutely in science in terms of what people can do, they're kind of relevant to everyone, particularly women, I would say no matter what your age, right? I agree with you. I I completely agree on everything you said. Alzheimer's disease is not like you, you, you just all of a sudden catch a cold. 
way. It's not like tomorrow you go to the doctor and boom, you have Alzheimer's disease. There's something that's been happening in your brain for a really, really long time that eventually leads to the symptoms, which again speaks to how resilient the brain is, how strong these brains we have are, because they can literally fend off a whole amount of pathology and insults and, and problems for years and years and years. And your ability and your brain's cognitive reserve of reserve right, against these insults is really largely based on the way you live your life. There is a genetic component. Our DNA is part of whoever we are, everything we are is involved in every bodily and neurological function. However, your medical report, heart, report card and your lifestyle matter just as much for the vast majority of people. Like even in patients with genetically determined Alzheimer's, even for those very rare patients who carry genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's at a young age, there's evidence that things like exercise can really delay the onset of dementia. And for the vast majority of the population, over 98% of people do not carry this genetic mutation. So risk is really more about the interplay of factors like, sure, there are genetic risk factors, your genes are important, but your lifestyle is just as important, your environment is just as important, your medical health is just as important. And those are the things that we need to take care of pretty much as soon as we're aware that they're important. It's not like you're 50 and today you have to take care of your brain. No, this, this brain health should really be part of overall health. We should really start thinking about our brains as our best friends yeah. and the part of us that needs nurturing and supporting that is doing so much for us, right? So I think it's really important that we make choices that really support the brain. And I, I usually like to say, that I encourage everyone to think of their brains more like a muscle, right? There are things that you can do to make your brain stronger. You can exercise it properly. You can feed it properly. You can take care of it properly. And your brain will perform so much better for you. If you're a 50 year, year old woman on a Mediterranean diet, your brain looks at least five years younger as compared to a woman who's also 50 years old, but who's been on a Western diet for most of her life. I mean, you can see them. You can see the brain scans. You can see the way the brain doesn't change when you follow a Mediterranean-style diet and the way your brain literally shrinks at age 50 when, when you are on a Western-style diet. And, and do we know, obviously, you mentioned one component. Some of those foods there are obviously very prevalent in Mediterranean-style diets. The term Mediterranean-style diet gets misinterpreted quite a lot, and lots of people right. use it to, to make their... Yeah, to make the case <laughs> for different kinds of foods. And so I wonder, and I appreciate you've written a whole book, Brain Food, on different foods for your brain, which, which is well worth reading. And so lots of practical advice in that and lots of specific foods. But, you know, is there some general broad principles of w what you're talking about when you say the Mediterranean diet? Yes. And I think, again, it's important to say Mediterranean style diet because otherwise it becomes really impractical even for me i can't find the same foods here yeah. that i used to eat in italy growing up but the point is plant-centric so vegetables and fruit and grains and legumes are really the focus of the diet when we use condiments they're more like unrefined vegetable oils like extra virgin olive oil flax oil also fish is a big part of the mediterranean diet whereas Meat and dairy products are considered more like a treat, like an, an occasional treat. It's a very flexible diet. It's a very reasonable yeah. diet. It's not, you know, it's, it's not in any way suggesting deprivation or food restriction, which I find very sensible as a scientist. We always talk about diversity in the diet as being real key to health. Your health in midlife is the best predictor of your health for the rest of your life. So this is the time to really start being consistent. And if you're past midlife, then you have to be more consistent. Yeah. You no, know? but it's the same strategy, it's the same process. It takes discipline 
to take care of our brains, but the benefits are for life. Really hope you enjoyed that conversation. Please do think about one thing that you can take and apply into your life. Inspiration is not enough, you need to take action. If you did enjoy that, please do press subscribe, hit that notification bell, and why not check out this conversation that I picked out that acts as the perfect follow-up.